been thrown out, so I guess I'm free, right? Amen. Amen. No flags. <laughs> that was pretty funny. I do want to straighten one thing out. I'm never going to hear the end of it from Ken Pounders now because everybody calls him Keith. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, anyhow, he that the training on the 12th is um, in. Um, I'm mean, sorry, the 11th, is in Morgantown at Harvest Church of God. It's, they're going to do Conquer Addiction, what they do. How many have heard the Conquer Addiction podcast from Ken Pounders? If you don't have that podcast and you have somebody struggling with addiction or no family has someone struggling with addiction, please have them listen to that podcast weekly because um, Outreach Ministries of Alabama does uh, the best job. They have the best stats because of God of any discipleship program that I know of, that they're, they're, for 50 years they have, they have discipled men out of addiction, and Ken was one of those people himself, if you know him. And he and Sonia, his wife, Sonia's dad started Outreach Ministries of Alabama. It's a real opportunity to get people to that training on Saturday in Morgantown. It's on Green Bag Road at Harvest um, Church of God, Scholar Michelle are, are hosting that along with the pastor there um, from House of His Presence. I plan on being there. But then Sunday evening here at 6 p.m., Ken and Sonia is going to be here. We're going to just have a night of worship. We've got other friends coming with us to, to worship and praise, and Ken's going to be speaking that night. There's an op- Listen, there's an opportunity then um, that weekend to talk to Ken, and my experience with addiction and Jesus setting me free is that you, a good thing is to get out of this area. Ken is willing to take people from anywhere, but people from here that could go to that, that discipleship program in Alabama, it would change their life. And we, can't, we know we can't make anybody go. People's got to want to go. People say, well, Ken will take anybody that wants to go. Amen? But people got to want to go, so they got to jump through some hoops. Amen? How many is familiar with people in addiction or been, if you've been addicted, you don't have to raise your hand, but I've been set free, so I'm okay. But, um, you know, uh, I always tell, I always tell addicts one thing when I meet them and we start talking, I know that addicts are liars. So we, <laughs> I, I've been in that background and, and from that place. And, but when, when we hit rock bottom, when somebody hits rock bottom, it's time to get help. And this is a great opportunity with them coming here to our region to get opportunity, to get training, and they want to train the church on that Saturday on how to deal with people in addiction. And I'm, I'm believing for Jesus to do a great work through it and set a lot of people free. Amen? Amen. How many would like to see all the addicts set free? How many would like to have a service here where we just have a trash can uh, full of needles and full of empty bottles and full of uh, drug paraphernalia where we can just fill a trash can with that stuff and people are set free? You know, I think like just getting five or six people free a year is not enough. We need to see that on a regular basis. And, and so here's an opportunity for that. So with that, um, the, the children can be dismissed. Uh, the legacy staying up today. And um, I'm going to get into the word. Turn around, tell somebody today you're glad they're here while the children are being dismissed today. You're, we good? All right. I don't know about y'all, but I could have went on in that worship. How about you? I think we were just getting started there, you know, um, but uh, here we go. I, I want to say, too, Friday night, the fifth quarter, it was a big hit. Yeah. Amen? It was good. We had, thank you all, thank you all for, for serving, for giving. You all rock. People, people came, and we had a good time. We had um, kids that we had never met before that we got to meet, and they came, and they hang out, they hung out, and we got, you know, we fed everybody, but it was a good time. It was a good testimony. There was lots of seeds planted, and the attitude here was great. The Spirit of God was here, and it, it was a safe place um, for people to come, and so we just, I think it was a blast, and it, we had perfect weather, and uh, it's rained ever since, so we had, we had a great time, and listen, most of us were up past midnight, and we didn't turn into a pumpkin, so <laughs> we, were, we were good. We were up past our bedtime the other night, but, but it was good. Praise the Lord. So um, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray a quick prayer. 
I believe in the power of quick prayers. I don't, go, I don't believe you've got to pray long. I, I believe that you pray by the Spirit. And I'm going to, how many wants to change today? You want your life to change. You want your, I believe we're supposed to be um, thermostats for society, not thermometers. And I believe God wants to reach in and turn up the temperature of your life today. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you. Come in here and change our lives. Let, let everyone watching or here that has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit's saying today. God, I pray that we would have open hearts, open eyes, open ears. I thank you for changing people's lives today for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'm going to talk about the normal Christian temperature. The normal Christian temperature. You know, Watchman Nee's one of my heroes, and you've, you've heard me say this before. One of my favorite quotes that he has, and Watchman Nee, they cut his tongue out in 1958 for preaching the gospel. They cut his tongue out in prison, and he won more people to Jesus through his books after that and, and through that time than he did when he could talk. Last night, Sandy was listening to the, the Chinese, the underground church. There, do you know that there's the, the church in China has went from 400,000 to 700 million. Their pastors, their seminary is jail. They don't trust preachers who don't go to jail. Kind of makes me feel like a Vienna sausage in a steakhouse. They don't, they don't trust any... They, they, when, it, when somebody's called to preach in China, they... they they ask, um, how many years of seminary do you want? And this man, it broke my heart, but it, was just, it just showed me the reality of what our brothers and sisters face in the world. And I think, dear God, we have to get our temperature up to normal in America. And watch Manee said, when the average Christian gets up to normal temperature, everyone thinks they have a fever. And so while we have a society that says... You know, keep your religion, and we're dealing with religion on Wednesday night, keep your Christianity inside the four walls, make it a personal matter. We have hell out there spewing everything they want on media, and they're not keeping it in their house, they're not keeping it in their closet, they're, they're spewing hell throughout the media, throughout everything. It's disgusting what we see going on in our society, but the church has bought the lie that somehow we should just be these nice little lay out, now lay me down to sleep Christians that, that, are, that are just you know, casual about our walk with God. And it's a lie, it's a lie that the church has, has swallowed that we're just supposed to be these, these uh, little, little uh, Christian creatures with this uh, preacher creature up front here, and we just come in and, and we just attend a service, and we, we, but our temperature is just supposed to stay, you know, we're just supposed to be balanced. I hate that word. You know what we don't need is more balanced Christians, we need more accurate Christians. We don't need more balanced preaching. We need more accurate preaching. We need an accurate idea of what it means to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him wherever we must. And so Sandy was listening to this story last night. I was like, why do you got to listen to this before I go to bed? And this, this boy, was, was his father had been beaten every day for being a preacher, Every day, and he didn't know if he'd ever see his dad again. And he said they brought out this man that he did not recognize on a slab, this man that weighed less than 90 pounds out on a slab. And he said the only way I knew it was my dad was his eyes. And he said, I looked at my father, and I said, I'm, I'm more proud of you than anybody that's ever lived on this earth, Dad, for being tortured for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, son, I'll be proud of you to do the same. I thought, wow. How's that fit my theology? How's that, how's that fit my Sunday walk with God? How's that fit my, my, like, you know, people said some junk about me the last couple of weeks, and, you know, I can get my feelings hurt. You know, what? What? They, he, he talked about his dad. Every day, this guard would go to the bathroom on a piece of toast. And give it to him for breakfast every day. That was their joke. To feed him breakfast, they went to the bathroom. Dad never denied Christ. 
And I thought, man, we were, we were praying about this morning. We got to get people in the seven mountains of culture that are Christians that will not just think good thoughts and send good vibes, but will stand up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with a normal temperature. Come on, worthy to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. Whew. Listen, y'all, I'm not here to, to, to scare anybody, but I'm telling you, this is, this is where America's headed. We got to be a, 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 a people that have a normal temperature. Come on, Brittany, you're a nurse. You know, people got to have the right vital signs to live, right? Karen, you remember? Like, we got to have the, you do vitals all the time, right? We got to have the right vital signs to live. The church, is, the church needs to have the right temperature to be vibrant, to be alive. It's not just depending on the preacher, but it's us together. We need Christian politicians. We need Christian school teachers. We need Christians in arts and entertainment. We need Christian movie makers. We need Christian authors. We need, we need Christians in our own school board in Garrett County. We need Christians in our own school board in Preston County and in Fayette County and Somerset County. We need people right here, senators right here. And we need people right here that own businesses, kingdom people that will buy up cities. And the easiest way to control a city is to own it. Christians got to get the mentality that if I'm a mechanic and I have a garage, it's a kingdom garage. And we're going to make a difference with this garage. We're going to do with this cafe. This is a kingdom cafe. You know, I'll be 60 this year. I don't need another thing to do. Keith Collins is like, Mike, why don't you just find something else to do? I mean, come on, man. Why don't you just, you know, why don't you just stay up 24 hours? Because there's this burning that I feel from heaven. After 33 years of ministry of this, why did we add, we didn't add on this building so everybody could say, oh, nice carpet, cool lights. No. It's because God wants to create a, a, an epicenter here of people that are on fire for Jesus. They have the right temperature. It won't be for the status quo Christian. Don't worry about getting your feelings hurt that you're not the cool status quo church. <laughs> Understand this. The most important thing is that hell knows your name. When you get up in the morning, the hell knows your name. That hell trembles because you're putting on your little socks. And you're putting on your little shoesies. And you're tying your little strings. And you're getting ready to go out there in the world and be a normal Christian. Because you upset the balances of hell. You upset the balances of darkness to light when you get saved. I remember a man told me out of the bar when I got saved, he said, son, when you got saved, the scales just tipped. Yeah, he was right. When you got saved, maybe you're the first one in your family saved, the scales just got tipped. Maybe you're going to be the first one to burn for Jesus in your family. The scales just got tipped. Maybe you're the first normal Christian that you work, where you work. The scales just got tipped at work. Be encouraged. Come on. I've been spit at and people give me the finger and all kind of stuff like that. That ain't nothing to being in prison in China. Come on. People may, may unfriend you on Facebook. Scare me. Come on. They might call you a fanatic or a lunatic, but yet they can scream over a football game. Come on. I promised Jesus. I said, when I got saved, I said, if you can use me, I'll go for you as hard as I partied. I will. I've kept that promise for 34 years to go for Jesus as hard as I partied. I want to go harder. Come on. When everybody else left, I stayed. The same way with God. I want to do the same thing. Normal Christianity. The normal temperature. I got this when I was reading in the Passion Translation the other day. I got this. It says that we're to be boiling hot. I got this. The normal temperature is 212. You want to know what the normal Christian temperature is? It's not 98.6. It's 212. Boiling. Hot. Boiling. <laughs> Come on. I don't even know where to go with this. <laughs> Romans 12. I knew the guys would know this was an easy morning because I only had a couple scriptures. 
<laughs> but Romans 12, 9 to 21, I want to read this before I preach anymore because I'm fired up and I realize I will not say this if I don't say it now. So Romans 12, 9 to 21, this, this, is, a, this is a statement in the Word that's one of those this is one of those easy um, to understand, straightforward, this is what a normal Christian lives like. This is, this is one of those portions of Scripture that's very easy to be understood. And, and you know, it all is, but it's just, it's just opening it up. We were talking about Sandy and I were talking about the Old Testament and, uh, and, and being able to explain to people the things that happened in the Old Testament. And, and I don't know everything. I'm not saying I do. But there's so many things that's easy to be understood that people fight about. Okay, so if you're there in Romans 12, I'm going to read it first in the New King James Version. Then I'm going to read it in the Passion Translation. I like reading the Passion Translation as a devotional. But it says this. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor or loathe or hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Again, this is living a normal Christian life. Okay? Not lagging in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Fervent. You can underline that. Or you can mark it or highlight it with your little yellow, drag your little finger across your phone. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Praise God. It's a turning point. I've had to keep my eyes on Jesus. How about y'all? Because there's stuff going on that really upsets me. And there's, there's stuff going on today that's disgusting in society. But he said, rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. This is leaning into God. We got to lean into God. Say lean into God. We got we to lean into God in, in patience and tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Verse 14, that the Tao turns, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, The reason I stopped is I just want you to think about that for a second. <laughs> bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're at the point where we, we don't curse them anymore, <laughs> but we just can't bless them. But he says, he says, bless those, this is normal Christianity, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, praise the Lord. There's no jealousy in that, right? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Amen. Amen. I remember one time, I don't know why this came to me, years ago, Sandy and I, we drove a lot of broke down cars. Anybody ever drove a lot of junk? And don't say because I drove a Chevy, just I had a lot of junk. And one time in ministry, both my cars blew up, you know, at one time. And we, we had nothing to drive. And we were praying for a minivan. And guess what? Everywhere I turned, people would come up, hey, look at our new minivan. Praise the Lord. You know, that happened to me about six times. And finally, I, I got in prayer. And I said, Lord, where am I at in line? Right? But rejoice. Even if you're waiting on something, rejoice with anybody else that gets blessed. It's a test. If you get jealous and, well, they don't deserve no minivan. Well, I'm out here trying to serve God, and I ain't got no minivan. And the, 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 the sad truth is, a man who loves hot rods was praying for a minivan? <laughs> like, I thought like some alien must have sucked out my head or something. But a minivan was what we needed, you know? But I know that the Lord showed me in that whole time that because I rejoiced at everybody that pulled up, I genuinely rejoiced. I, when they pulled up in their new car, I'd say, you deserve it. 
Because I hated people. Do you ever have people in your family and you buy something and everything you buy, they, they find something wrong with it? That kind of irks me. I say, oh, I got this, I got this van. Well, there's a scratch on it. Like I needed you. Anyhow. <laughs> but, what, but if you genuinely rejoice for people who get what you want, yours is coming. But if you're snarky and mean, Mitch told me this new word the other day, swimmingly. I'm like, swimmingly? Things were going swimmingly. I'm like, wonder if you can't swim. <laughs> swimmingly is not good. It's sinkingly. And, and that's the way I feel a lot of times, sinkingly, not swimmingly, you know? But if you get an old attitude inside, in, God knows the heart. And if inside we get an attitude when other people are getting blessed, we're not going to get blessed soon. Till we get over the attitude. You can thank me later. Anyhow, <laughs> rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. It's empathy to weep with those who weep. It's, it's, it's not empathy to get in the dumps with them. It's empathy to weep and try to get them out of it to help. That's why when people come to you and say, I got stage four cancer, it's, the thing is not to say, poor you. The thing is to have empathy enough to begin to fast and pray and lay hands on them and believe for a miracle for them is true empathy. Some people are taught we just want stroked when we get a bad report. That won't get you healed. Jesus didn't do that, right? He's, he went about... Jesus went about doing good, the Bible says, and he did good stuff, and he healed all were sick, all were oppressed. He healed them. So he says, um, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, get down the dirt with them. Do you know some people that are struggling right now today, all they need is somebody to get in the dirt with them and not eat a bowl of ice cream and a bunch of brownies, although that's okay. It's okay to medicate sometimes, but just not with the whole box or the whole half gallon. You need somebody to get down with. How many ever medicate with food and you know you're doing it? My spiritual mom, she told me one time, she said, Mike, it's okay to medicate with ice cream, just half a cup. Well, that's enough to make me mad. Well, then you need to pray. Amen? Then if half a cup won't do it, you need to pray because you're addicted, right? Okay, so anyhow, just advice she gave me, just sharing it with you. Anyhow. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Whew. Like we know better. I'm just going to be quiet on that one for a second. Don't be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I used this scripture with the Lord one day, and I said, it's just not possible with me. <laughs> and he said, yes, it is. So, uh, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. God's going to take care of it better than you ever could. Matter of fact, if you knew what God was going to do to the people that did, if you knew what was going to happen to these people, did horrible things, murder and rape and incest and all these things, if you knew what was going to happen to them, you would, you would pray that they would repent and God would have mercy on their soul because the torment in hell is everlasting. There's nothing, there's nothing you could do to anybody one time, even if you killed them, that could even compare to the vengeance of the Lord on an unrepentant soul. Never. I mean, read the word. <laughs> he said, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with, by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's the good news. I want to just read three verses of this in the Passion Translation, okay? Back to Hebrews 12, 9 to, 9 to 11. It says, let the inner movement... You guys got that? Let, let the inner movement of your heart always be to love one another and never play the role of an actor wearing a mask. Church is the safest place to be real. 
You don't ever have to be an actor wearing a mask. Despise evil, embrace everything that is good and virtuous, and be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as much as one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor of one another. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. Try to outdo one another in loving and respecting people? There's something to do. That's a good competition. That's healthy competition in the church is to try to outdo one another in this area. Be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot. Boiling hot. This is where I got this message from. Boiling hot is the normal temperature of a Christian. Radiate with the glow of the Holy Spirit and let him fill you with excitement as you serve him. Wow. Let, his, let this hope burst forth within you, releasing continual joy. Do not give up in a time of trouble, but commune with God at all times. Take a constant interest in the needs of God's beloved people and respond by helping them and eagerly welcome people as guests into your home. Speak blessing, not cursing over those who reject and persecute you. Celebrate with those who celebrate. Weep with those who grieve. Live happily together in a spirit of harmony and be as mindful of one another's worth as you are of your own. Don't live with lofty mindset thinking you are too important to serve others, but be willing to do menial tasks and identify with those who are humble-minded. Don't be smug or even think for a moment that you know it all. Never hold a grudge or try to get even, but plan your life around the noblest way to benefit others. Do your best to live as everybody's friend. Beloved, don't be obsessed with taking revenge, but leave for God's righteous justice. For the scriptures say, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And if your enemy is hungry, buy him lunch. Win him over with kindness, for your surprising generosity will awaken his conscience, for God will reward you with favor. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. Wow. Back to verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Every, listen, I don't care about what people say about hypocrites. I care about what God says about hypocrites. And God says, let your love be without hypocrisy. In other words, let your love be like Jesus, which there's three things about that. It's pure, it's clear, and it's unconditional. If you want to love like Jesus, it's got to be pure, clear, and unconditional love. Not like a hypocrite. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, notice, we live in a world that is a postmodern generation. There's no, there's no biblical worldview other than from the church, and some churches don't have a biblical worldview, but this church has a biblical worldview. We believe the Bible. Amen. We view right and wrong from the Bible. So it says here, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Notice it doesn't say, abhor what you think is evil and cling to what you think is good. Because this has slipped into the church. People, people hate what they think is evil, and people love and cling to what they think is good, and that's not what it says here. It says we got to have a basis for what we think is good and what we think is evil, and our basis is the Word of God. Are you with me? If people's going to throw stones at you, let them throw stones at you for believing the Word, not your opinion. One of the greatest things, Billy Graham was a man of great grace. And one of the greatest things I always saw Billy Graham do when he was under fire was the word says. They would say, Billy, what do you believe on homosexuality? And he would say, well, the word says. And the word is my opinion. Billy, what do you think on this in in society or that in society? It didn't matter where he was in the world, if he was with kings or presidents or princes or whoever, Billy Graham had the same answer all the time, a man of great grace and wisdom, and he said, it's what the Word says is what I believe, and if you're going to have to take up offense, you're going to have to take up offense with God, because I just believe what the Word says. That's the normal Christian. The normal Christian in all walks of society, whether you're a truck driver, a school teacher, a carpenter, whatever you are, in all walks of society, a normal Christian should go by what the Word says. And we should abhor what is evil. It means to loathe it, to hate it. It means evil should be disgusting to us. 
The people should not be disgusting to us. In our personal likes and dislikes, we may feel disgusted at them. But we should have all the verse 9 through 21, we should live that with every human being, no matter if they disgust us or not. It's what they do. What they're doing, trying to do to our children in this generation is disgusting. The ideals, the, the, the molestation, the manipulation, they're being molested by the ideals of this postmodern generation. They're being molested. They're not emotionally old enough at five years old and, and four years old to be forced with these gender decisions that are just bringing, they're just bringing confusion, more confusion, and it's, it's, they're molesting them. It's disgusting. I know it, it, somebody might say something about this. Sorry. It's disgusting. I loathe it because God never intended it to be that way. He decided. He decided biology. He decided gender. He decided it. People need help that, that with, with gender that today. People need help with these basic things. Everybody hating everybody is not going to do it. There, there's, there's got to be real love, the love of God that's pure, clear, and unconditional. But we should be disgusted at what's being done. We don't have to celebrate it. We can agree to disagree and still love people, but we, we don't have to partake in it. Are you with me? That's not love. It's like I've used many times. If you see, if you see a boatload of people and they're headed for the waterfalls, is it, is it love to just wave at them and say, hey? Or is it love to say, stop! You're about to go over a waterfall. Our whole, our whole education system is going over a waterfall. Our whole, our whole society is going over a waterfall. We, we, have to, we have to not go with what, oh, that, that's disgusting to me. Throw your opinion out of it. What is disgusting to the word? I, I, I got to move on. That, it said, hold fast, embrace what is good. It, it's based, the only way you can have this mindset today is if you're born again. If you're not born again, you won't have this mindset. You're going to be sucked into what everybody says at the break room at work. Or what everybody's opinions are at the cash register. What everybody's opinions are at school or wherever you hang out. You're going, to be, you're going to be sucked into what everybody, well, I think this and I think that. I believe the word. And I better be able to back it up, not give some vague scripture. It's funny to me, and, and everybody knows this here, but I, when I pull in someplace and somebody calls me preacher, I usually know there's a question coming. <laughs> Amen. I mean, I pulled in one day to take my trash, and they said, hey, preacher. I knew it was coming. They had this theological question for me about the last days. Can I tell you something? There's so many people torqued up about the end of the world that won't even go to church. They're break room prophets, right? They're people that have enough of the Bible to be dangerous. Can I tell you something? Jesus is coming. We don't know when. The angels don't know when. It's, you quit trying to predict it. Live ready. The Bible says, I love what Lance Walno says, and this is going to be my statement on it. Lance Walno says, we're supposed to occupy until he comes, not be preoccupied with when he comes. But what I see is the church fighting, they're preoccupied with when he comes. You know, they, I'm old enough to know they wrote a book in 1988. 88 Ways the Lord was going to come in 1988. Then Y2K. My Lord, let's store up truckloads of water and let's get ready. And this is 2023. Right? A lot of that was just, uh, there's a lot of fear mongering going on by people. Did you see how our, our live stream increased so much at times when there's fear? It's fear. Well, now we're not afraid anymore. Whew. That scare's over. No, honey. You could be going like that. Be ready. 
How many of you know that last statistics I got was one out of one people die? One out of one die. Everybody dies. Not everybody wants to talk about dying, but we're all going to die. If you go to a church and it doesn't prepare you for dying, it's sure not going to prepare you for living. We need to be ready. We need to live like this. I got to go on. When we're transformed into the image of Christ, we begin to know what to be disgusted at and what to love and cling on to. Our mind gets renewed into the mind of Christ. What disgusts him should disgust us. What, what he loves, we should cling to. I pray that the Lord will help us hear and see what he's saying. He goes on verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Verse 11, I'm going to quit with this. Verse 11, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, boiling hot. There's a difference. Can I tell you something? There's a difference between hot and boiling. Do you all know that? Let me give you a, a, an illustration. You ever make macaroni and cheese? How many like macaroni and cheese? It's the food of bachelors, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I used to eat mac and cheese out of the pot. Not proud of it, did it. But I'll tell you what, there is no longer time than being hungry and watching that pot of water go from hot to boiling. Seems like an eternity when you're hungry, right? That thing's got to boil. Well, my grandma always said, don't watch a boiling pot. Well, she was superstitious, so... She got saved, though. But praise the Lord, I don't believe in superstition. <laughs> I believe in favor. I believe in blessing, not superstition. If your grandma said that, just break that curse off yourself and don't watch the pot. Not because she said, but like you can do something for that 37 hours, you know? It, seriously, you watch, you, watch something go from, you watch something go from hot to boiling. It's like, is it boiling yet? Is it boiling yet? Is it boiling? Kids are like, is it boiling yet? Is the mac and cheese done yet? No, we can't stick the macaroni in it until it's boiling. It just got to boil. If it don't boil, you're going to have hard little macaronis. They'll just be like flying boomerangs, hit you right in the head. You know, you got to have, you got to have, you got to have boiling water. So you, you got to understand that for Christians, we, when the Lord touches you, you boil. But you go from boiling to hot gradually, like a pot cools down. And you go to lukewarm, which Jesus said he don't want us to be lukewarm. He said he'd spew that out of his mouth. But it happens gradually when you stop being a normal Christian. And you know how you stop being a normal Christian? You gradually, you gradually quit doing the things of Romans 12, 9 to 21. You gradually, you gradually let other things take the place of the right thing. It can be in all walks of life. When you, when, you go from, when you go from boiling to hot to cold, it's because of what you surround yourself with. In life, I bought this old heating pad. How many have a heating pad? If you need it, I'll plug it in after service. You can sit on it or whatever. <laughs> it, it, whatever you surround yourself with is going to determine your temperature. When people have a fever, they give them an ice bath. They put ice on them. When people are cold, they warm them up. The, the, the issue is with Christians... It's the same. We're going we're gonna to have people. We're going to do activities. We're going to make mental decisions. We're going to use our thought life every day. And you young people, I want you to hear this too. All you teenagers, what, the people you surround yourself with, they're going to be a heating pad to your life or they're going to be an ice block. When you're looking... And, and it's time and you're looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or even a friend of any kind. You're going to have friends in your life. You're going to have to choose. Do you want to be around a bunch of ice, ice blocks or do you want to be around a bunch of heating pads? Well, if you're a Christian, your opinion should go out the doggone window. Is doggone okay? I just said it. Doggone window. Huh? Snap. Out the window. 
Swimmingly. <laughs> swimmingly. This is real swimmingly. Really good. You're, you you got you got to decide. You're going to walk with Jesus. Or you're going to walk with these knuckleheads. I want around. I want around people that make me two sixteen. I want around people that when I talk to them, when I pray with them, when I ride down the road with them, we're causing some water to boil. When my family rides down the road, we're talking about, is there going to be somebody at the restaurant today that we're going to be able to sow a seed in? Is there going to be somebody we can give a big tip to that it may change their life? Is there going to be somebody we can pray with today? That's the kind of people I want to run with. Come on. You know, me and Keith Collins, we came in here last night to pray. You know, we were in our pajamas. Well, I was. <laughs> you know, I, I, I did. It was my sweatpants pajamas. Okay, just to say. It wasn't like you know, footies and stuff, you know, with those kind of pajamas, <laughs> just to give you a mental picture. And we came in here to pray because we wanted to, because we wanted to, because we were sitting at the house like a couple old men, and I said, let's go pray. He said, I'm game. Let's go pray. And we came here and we prayed, not to get a message, not so we could look spiritual because we want fire. I can't preach without fire. I can't live without fire. I was born in fire. Jesus touched me. I boiled. I ain't quit. He needs something done. I'm the man. When I got saved, you can ask my wife. They had a little church sign. I painted a church sign. I became a sign painter. They need a bathroom. I built a bathroom. They said, we need somebody to clean the church. I'm your man. They said, we need somebody to mow the grass. I'm your man. They said, we need somebody to preach. What? I'm your man. I'll fill in. I'm still fill in. I fill in for everybody. Why? I want to. Sandy wants to. We still want to, don't we, honey? When we die, we won't want to anymore. But we haven't done nothing compared to these dudes in prison. They're given a piece of toast that they went to the bathroom on to eat for breakfast every day. and That's all they get. Nah, we ain't done nothing. But I want to be around people. I want a church that's a heating pad. Matter of fact, I'd like you all to be little burners. Little, I, I, I would, I, my, the, the biggest thing, somebody told me one time, the biggest thing you're guilty of as a pastor is wanting everybody to be on fire. Well, I like that compliment. Because that's normal. The other churches that are dead or parked, they're not normal churches. I'm not picking at anybody. I'm picking at everybody. I'm picking at everybody that's not boiling is not a normal church. Because Jesus has fire in his eyes. <laughs> he looks at me. Woo! That's what happened in worship. I started crying because he looked at me. He looks at you and he chooses you. You think I'm just a knucklehead. Well, he's choosing you anyhow. He chose a knucklehead like me. He'll choose a knucklehead like you. But you young people got to decide. I've always told Anna, if you can make it to your 25 being on fire for Jesus, you're, you're way ahead of other kids. You're way ahead of other kids. Why? Because they, they got to sow their wild oats. Where'd that come from? Is that biblical? No. That's some knucklehead in the bar, right? I had people in bar give me lots of advice. Anybody else? I had pre-training for being a pastor. I was a bartender and bouncer. It's great for pastoring. You know who to serve and who to get rid of. <laughs> Amen. You do. It's true. You know. You know who, who's, who's going to be a block of ice. And, you know, I, I get some people sometimes in their ministries, pastoral discouragement. They go have their ministry somewhere else. I'm discouraged enough, right? <laughs> Listen, you, whoever you choose to hang with, whoever you choose to do social media with, however you choose to act at work, you're going to be one or the other. You're going to be one or the other for other people. 
You going to deny Christ at work? You're going, to, you're going to go into work having a bunch of vengeance and a bunch of judgment about everybody else? You're going to run your mouth about everybody else? You're going to gossip? You're going to not be like Jesus? You're not going to love like Jesus? You're going to have to decide. You're going to have to decide when the conversations go dark. You're going to have to decide if you're going to be light or you're going to go in with them. You're going to act better than everybody else? I've done retail for years. I know what retail's like. People talk about people after they leave the store. What are you all looking at me for? You worked retail. You know what it's like. They do. They start chewing on everybody that left. Well, I think he, would you see what he, well, he talk to me like that. I just you know, hold his stuff up, whatever. Amen. Come on. Oh, it's this guy again coming in. We don't want to see him, right? They're going to they're gonna look around all day, beat us down on everything that we got in the store, and they're not going to buy no furniture anyhow. Choo, doggy, I'm preaching now. It's just life. It all makes us cool down. All that talk makes us cool down. When we pray, hot. When we neglect prayer to do something else, popular uh, today in society is people don't want to go to church. Church is needful, it's your family. The Bible says, as you see the day approaching, don't neglect the assembly of yourselves together. It's clear. We need to be part of a body, right? Here, here's how you start to get cold, okay? I've seen God put families together. No doubt it was God. I've seen marriages ready to disintegrate. I've seen people on the verge of not just divorce, but killing one another. And I've seen God put it back together. And then what they do is they put family time ahead of church. Everybody needs family time. Amen? But make church part of your family time. Portray it that way, that it's part of our family time is going to church. It's this way, and, and, and you're old enough to hear this, you know, Sandy and I can hold hands in public that is appropriate as a married couple to hold hands, right? But we're never going to Hear me, we're never going to be intimate in public because that's not appropriate, even for a married couple. But we have something called a home where our family is, and our family can have an intimate time in that living room. That's like church. This is the family of God, and this is our living room. So we have our intimate time together as a family in this room. But Sandy and I have a bedroom, and that's where it's just intimate time with me and her. That's your prayer closet. The appropriate thing for you to do is not neglect your prayer closet. How many ever started to get a consistent prayer life, and as soon as you start to pray, oh, I, I need to paint that door, and I, I need to go, I forgot to let the dog out. Maybe the oven's on, and, you know, I got things to do, and I got a headache, and I can't read the Word, and it's not making sense. And I've read this same paragraph 25 times, and I don't, still don't know what it says. How many's ever had that kind of battle before? Because the enemy don't want you to get it. Because intimacy is where multiplication comes from. When God said, be fruitful and multiply, it comes from intimacy. But you don't get that by just holding hands, walking down the road, saying you know Jesus. You, and you don't, get, you don't get on fire just saying, well, I believe in God. Well, I believe in God. They say the world's going to end October 4th. I believe in God. I've heard that three times this week. But listen to me. When you're intimate with God, nothing will shake you. I'm not, listen, I'm nowhere near these Chinese preachers. I'm not. I'm not. I don't feel that I am. I don't know that if I could do that. All I know is God's graced me to do what I do. And he's, he's called us not to neglect our fire. Matter of fact, from the Old Testament to the New, he said the priest is to keep the wood on the altar. We are to keep our fire boiling hot. We are to, we are to tend our own fire. But the thing I, I, I want to get uh, by today is we can't, we, can't un, we can't put things ahead of God. 
The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. and Everything you need will be added to you. I was reading some famous atheist last words. Somebody put on social media. It was really scary about how they, their last words was, I've spent my life with philosophy and I've spent my life being an atheist and now I know I'm doomed to a hell that nobody can save me from. Like people like, I'm talking about people like Thomas Paine and Anton LaVey, the founder of the Satanic Church. These people, I, I mean, their last words was the reality of an eternity without God. And none of, these, none of these famous atheists would be telling the church, cool down, cool down, cool down. No, in hell they'd be crying out, please someone preach. Please someone be on fire. I'd rather have somebody that I've told the gospel in love hate me for it. I'd rather society hate me for not being politically correct than to see them go to hell. I'd rather have them hate me than see them go to hell or see my children go to hell for not telling them the truth, for not not standing on the Word of God. Not to appease people, but to appease God. Are you with me? I'm almost done. I feel the Holy Spirit in here, y'all. Something happened when we opened up this wall. We, we stepped into new ground. Our society has changed. People, people that don't go to church, they'll say, you're at church all the time. Do you ever have anybody in your family say that? You're, you're just at church all the time. You know what? They're someplace all the time. You're buying lottery tickets all the time. You're shopping all the time. You can be oh so sick, but say shopping. You're up and dressed and you're out the door, baby. Come on. Oh, you don't feel like doing nothing, but say, but say hunting, and you're, you're up going hunting, or say fishing, and you're up and going fishing, or golf, and you're going golf, or whatever, whatever it is. We all, I could just keep on going right down the line, but I'm not trying to pick on anybody in particular. I'm just saying, well, there's things that we put ahead of God, but when we're hot, He's first. When we're boiling, He's first. And guess what? And, and we don't feel like we're sacrificing we're hot. Right? And I tell you what, if you're boiling, people will, you'll, you'll, there will be people who won't be, want to be around you. They won't. They'll be like, that's nice for you. Back. Right? Young people, am I right? If you're going to be really on fire, you got people that will be disgusted with you. Well, you're just picking on them people because of your opinions. It's not my opinion. I stay away because God says stay away. Are you with me? We can't be casual about our walk with God. If we're not careful, our, our temperature goes from boiling to hot to cold. Guard your intimacy with God. You know, we can't neglect God for other things. There's nothing wrong with other things. You can have a hobby. Have at it. You can go shopping. Oh, thank you, Pastor Mike. Yeah, you can go shopping all you want. I don't care if you got 10 packages a day from Amazon coming to your porch, whatever. It's none of my business. But if you don't, if you don't put God above Amazon, listen to this. We'll scroll everything. All, how many people scroll looking for stuff? The great prophet Google. We're looking for the great prophet Google every day. But how many of us, how many of us would go, be challenged to go look up the word fervency in the Greek? Go to Precept Austin and look up fervency. Go to the Matthew Henry commentary and look up fervency. Go, go down. You know what? There's Christians that have been Christians for years that never use a concordance, don't know a Greek word, don't know a Hebrew word, yet the Bible. We got to read the Bible. A chapter a day won't keep the devil away. That's religion. But a chapter a day because it's him talking to me, that's good. A chapter a day is not hard to do, y'all. You can listen. Listen, I promised the Lord 34 years ago, 
I said, God, do you want me to go to Bible college or, or what do you want? He said, I want you to sit at my feet 40 hours a week. And I did. And I read the Bible. I didn't just read the Bible. I studied the Bible four and three-fourths time in 10 months. Those Bibles are wore out in 10 months. Now, am I bragging? No, I'm just reporting. What he said to do, I'm his man. I pray that's you. Because if you and I are all his people, we can change the world. Look what he did with 12 people. And, and, and it's still going on to us today. Look what he can do with you, man. I'm excited. Woo! Y'all don't look excited. But I'm excited. Because, listen, I've been doing this a long time. What, the, I, don't get my, I don't get my kudos from everybody. I get them from Jesus. And what I'm saying is, I believe he's saying today, it's time that we become normal Christians again in America. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, be not deceived. Be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Don't be deceived. What you surround yourself with will determine your temperature. Today, you put yourself in a place of fire. <laughs> Whether you know it or not. You put yourself smack dab in the middle of a place of fire. You're here. Not the Hebrew children fire, but the fire of God. It's here. Let's stand. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Shoo. Boiling water doesn't just happen. Cold doesn't just happen. It comes through neglect or it comes through tending it. You're going to feed yourself the rest of this day. Probably some of you are ready right now. Your little hungry alarm clock's going off. I pray that your hungry for God alarm clock's going off. I pray you're ready to say, God, I repent of anything in my life that's an ice pack. As I want to burn for you, Jesus. I want to be a normal Christian. I'm, I don't want to be a halfway Christian. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a good little Christian. I want to be an on fire boiling Christian, Jesus. I want that. I want to repent of anything I've done, any way I've neglected you or your fire. I want you to turn up the fire today in my life. You could be watching or here if you sense that today's the day to really make that prayer. Set me on fire, Jesus. Set me on fire. Make me boil for you. Whew. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to. I don't want to neglect the best thing for decent things in life. I, I, I read what one atheist said, and this atheist said, "I would give." He was a multimillionaire, and he said, "I would give half of everything I own for just one more day to live." But he didn't know how to live without Christ. But we know how to live with Christ. I want you to think about the day that God drew you to himself. It was mercy. In his mercy, he drew you to himself or back to himself. His mercy. Think about the mercy in your family. Think about the mercy that you've had of one more day of life. Today's a gift. Today's a gift. Today's a gift. Every day's a gift. It's a gift. Give me my green journal out of that bag. It's right there. The other morning I Thursday, I was praying, and I, I just, uh, I've watched people squander their life. I've watched God restore families, and then they, they don't serve God, or it becomes a burden. 
Watch people walk away from God. It's one of the hardest things in ministry is to watch people get an opportunity to know God and reject it or just walk away. I've watched people. I've been, I've been broken myself. I've watched people. I've watched my family go on, you know, not knowing if I had another day or not. But I just I determined that Psalm says, you know, teach us to number our days. Because we don't know if we'll have another day. But I, I, I wrote this in, in my journal. Today is a gift from God. Open it with prayer. Thank God for it. Make the most of every opportunity in it. This is an opportunity for you to boil or neglect and say, I, I, this is not for me. Pray for someone today. Smile and wave at everyone today. Open a door for others today. Hug those close to you today. Say I love you before you hang up or go out the door today. Forgive quickly today. Say you're sorry before the sun goes down today. Check the mirror for a frown today. Laugh often today. Laugh at yourself today. Laugh with others today. Be the light. Do shrug therapy when you can't control today. The situation that you're in, never take it too serious or yourself too serious, but never take the gift of a day God has given you for granted today. Don't save a good word that you have for somebody for a special day because you may never get that day. Encourage someone today. Everybody needs a little vitamin E, a little encouragement every day, every day. We got the opportunity because of Jesus in us to be thermostats for our society, to be a heating pad or to be an ice pack. I want to be a heating pad. None of us know how long we have. <laughs> it's just a fact. But I'm just going to ask you to do something with, with every head raised and every eye open. <laughs> I want you to make a conscious decision because I really believe it's important that we make conscious decisions to accept what God says or reject what God says. And I feel, I feel the the... The intensity of this moment. Like, my heart's pounding like it was when I got saved. <laughs> I had to get saved. I had to get saved. When that preacher preached, it was like he was preaching to me. You know what I pray every Sunday? That when I preach, it's like I'm preaching to you. Because <laughs> it did it for me. When that preacher preached, it was like every t everything he said, I thought somebody told him my life story. I pray it's that way for you today, and I, I pray your little heart's gone pitter-patter, pitter-patter, pitter-patter. I pray you're saying, I don't want to be cold. I want to boil. I want it to be like it was when I was first saved. And if you've never been a Christian, this is your opportunity to get saved. You're like I was. You're an individual without God. I knew about Jesus. I believed there was a Jesus. I just didn't know him. And when that preacher preached and he gave an opportunity for me to come forward to know him, man, I can still see myself coming forward and, and, and putting my knees down on that floor before God and surrendering my life. And I said, I'm your man. Today, if that's you, make that decision. And you're going to have to just clear out every other voice. Every other voice. Let's pray. Father, I pray if somebody's watching or somebody's here today, that every other voice is canceled out. That It's not about knowledge. It's about knowing you, Jesus. And I pray that people would come to know you. They would come to not just surrender their heart, but their life to you. I pray people that's been cold and, and, and backslidden in heart and, and frigid and lukewarm and all, all that, that people would come forward to you today. People watching that don't know you would come to know you today. People here would come and say, set me on fire for you, Jesus. I pray that would happen in this room this morning and on live stream and on YouTube, that it would happen today in Jesus' name. Now, I want you to make a step 
If that's you, if you're, if you're coming to give your life afresh to God, if you're coming for the first time to give your life to God, I want you to just come, make a step and come forward right now. This is our family living room. <laughs> the Father is here, yes. It's been a while since I've seen people run to an altar, but I've seen people run and dive. I had a man run and dive right on me one time, right in my lap, because he wanted God. And listen, that's the way I went for God. Don't take it casual today. If you need Jesus today, you want a fresh fire in your life, today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day. Come on. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask my wife and uh, Abby and others to pray to come. Come on, come on down. Listen, this is the best place, man. I just want you to do business with the Lord for a moment. I just want you to do business with the Lord. You know, I know we do, we do Firebrand every year. That's a, that's a big event that we do. It should be daily. Fire. 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 I believe fire to be stirred up in people today. I pray if you're in your living room today, and I believe there is somebody. I even believe there's somebody watching me today with a hangover. You got a hangover and you, 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 you might even still be drunk from last night. I don't know, but I believe you're watching me today and I believe that God is trying to get a hold of your heart to go past your head to your heart. And I've been that broken man away from God. If you're watching me today and you're away from God and you're that broken man or broken woman today and you, you haven't been able to put that, that bottle down or you haven't been able to put drugs down and you're just, you're just at a broken place here today and you're, you're watching it, but God's, God's sobering you up right now. He's sobering you up right now and, and, and this is real and he's got your attention and he's, he's drawing you to himself to burn today, to burn today. I just see fires, <laughs> little burners being lit today, honey, just little burners being lit today in this place. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Anybody that, that can or would, would you just lift your hands to the Lord? I believe this is a holy moment. The Bible says that we're to lift our hands without wrath and doubting. We're to, we're to lift our hands of assurance that, that he's God and we worship him as God today. We're worshiping him today, God. And we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I just want you, let's just, can we all just pray a simple prayer of surrender? I just, just if you would just repeat after me, say, Jesus, today I surrender everything, my life, my will, my emotions, my past, my today, my future, I surrender everything. You're worthy of my life because you died to give me life. Jesus, I repent of anything that's gotten in the way that I let get in the way between us. Things I've chosen that are not you in place of you. Forgive me, Lord. Set me free. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I believe right now that he has, he's communing with you. Thank him that you've returned to your first love. That's what returning to your first love is about. And if you don't know, if you've never known him, never made that commitment to him today, you're going to find a fire in your life, a fire. Whew. I feel the fire in this place. There's a fire in here. I pray that we never have a church, never have a church that's cold, that when people come in here, they find fire. And it's our job to each bring fire every week, that we bring fire every week, every week. Sandy, would you and Abby and 
you just start to pray for everybody. Uh, thank you, Lord. Greg, would you just come assist behind? And, uh, Sean, would you be an usher? Come back forward. Just want, just pray. If you just, if you just want prayer, just step here. We'll just pray for you quickly. You, those of you on live stream, we'll see you Wednesday night. Um, God bless you. And if anybody, after we pray for these people, if anybody has a prayer for any need, please come. If you need a miracle in your life, you need a healing, whatever. But I'm just, these are just people we're praying for fire. So go ahead and uh, we can pray right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
Doesn't it feel good to be normal? Yeah. Better to be on fire, right? Amen. I know people had to go. That's okay, too. If there's any time you got to go, you got to go. But I'm glad you all stayed. That did. Let's, let's, we're going to pray and dismiss the service and, and shake somebody's hand or give them a hug or high five or a, Dylan taught me a snail, whatever that is. <laughs> A snail, a snail bump or whatever that is. Anyway, let's pray. Thank you, Father. Let's really just give him glory. God, we thank you. You knew what we needed today. You, you always supply. You're more than enough. We pray that this week that, God, we would go out there and we're all going to be those heating pads. <laughs> we're going to be those people that cause people to, to get their temperature up. We're going to help those Christians that, that need a boost. We're going to help those unbelievers that don't know you. We're going to plant seeds. We're going to we're going to be the light. We're going to we're going to do what you've asked us to do without feeling like it's a burden, God. We're just going to 